the routine of Srila Prabhupada. So, the, no, no, the routine of Srila Prabhupada. Meaning his daily schedule? Yeah, da da daily schedule. I guess the, the ISKCON program is a replica of Prabhupada's uh, spiritual schedule, meaning the programs he wanted to be done. Yes, but it goes way beyond that, too. Oh, yes, yes, this, this, the. Uh, <laughs> When I was in New Vrindavan, I got a chance to be very close to Prabhupada's secret schedule. Not secret, but unwitnessed schedule. But it's true, that's what he did everywhere, not just in New Vrindavan. So what he would do is he would appear for the class in the morning, after sleeping, and appear for class in the morning, and um, he would be there for the kirtan. He would usually, it depended on the circumstance, he'd be there for the kirtan, he'd be there, give the class, and then all the prayers, everything like that, just as we do in a temple. Then, at taking prasadam, he would then go for a morning walk. And those who us who are lucky enough would figure out a way how to become part of that morning walk. There were the super lucky ones that rode in the car with Srila Prabhupada, and then there were the very, very lucky ones that, like myself, that had a car and we followed over and parked near where Prabhupada was. Then there were the less luckier ones that had to hitch a ride with somebody if they were going to get their own, but everybody was lucky because of the walk with Srila Prabhupada. And his walk would be usually around the park, or he would go to the beach and walk in Juhu. He made a specialty of walking on Juhu Beach. It was incredible morning walks. And he would walk, where else would he walk? Um, where else would he walk? He would. He would walk in Los Angeles, Hawaii, San Francisco, all the <laughs> Yes, Seattle. Seattle, Vancouver, Canada, uh, Toronto, all this, you know. Um, he, he was not only walking, he was giving, having philosophical debates and answering questions and doing everything yeah. all at once, you know. So he'd be walking along and people at that time knew it was their opportunity to challenge him and ask him challenging questions. Not negative challenge, but challenge saying, well, the scientist says we did not go to the moon or something like that. You know? yeah. Or no, scientist said we went to the moon. But I understand you say we did not go to the moon. These were trigger questions so that he would give a disser dissertation on it. <clears throat> when um, Sarup Damodar was there, uh, Prabhupada would always have him nearby and call him, what does he call him? Uh, um, Dr. T.D. His name was Dr. T.D. Singh, Bhakti Sarup Dhammaja Maharaj. Yeah, yeah, T.D. Singh, but he would say, uh, scientist, Mr. Scientist, can you, he would distinguish oh, yes, him yes. as a scientist, <laughs> then challenge him with questions that he could very seldom answer. <laughs> they weren't easy questions. Yeah. If, and spiritually, of course, we were all neophytes, even though we considered someone like Surat Damodar to be advanced. It, but that was back when the movement was only a few years old. Right. right. But at the same time, we fell in with the mood of Prabhupada's encouraging us, not only spiritually, but intellectually and and historically, knowledge-based, everything. So we would go on the morning walk and then come back. When we came back from morning walk, at least in Los Angeles, all the devotees would be lined up on the side of the sidewalk where he would walk. And the devotees, when he came out of his car, each one would hand him a, a flower nice flower, rose, carnation, whatever. And then when he came back with his armload of flowers, he'd hand one back to each devotee. 
Ah. Mm. Then he would go up in his room for breakfast. Did I say breakfast before? Usually, I think he had breakfast up till the morning walk. <coughs> and at that time, then people could come and see him if they had business to see him. And they would, again, discuss this different things that were going on in his gun, proposals and whatnot. And he would discuss them. And after that, he stayed upstairs and um, everything would go very nicely until the evening program, in which case he would conduct the evening program as well, give lectures and uh, lead kirtans. He always led the kirtan and um, usually led the kirtan. And then he would, uh, at some point, he would go upstairs, presumably to take rest. But he didn't take rest. But starting about 10 o'clock at night, he, this is what I learned at New Vrindavan, because I got to sneak up the stairs and hear him. He would be translating and, and creating his books. So starting around 9.30, 10 o'clock, he would go upstairs. He had five books he would lay out. He had the dictaphone. And he would be in a state of profound mystical trance. This I know because I watched him being in mystical trance. And he would translate until probably 1 o'clock in the morning. Then he would, I'm trying to be sure of the schedule. And he may have started earlier, maybe as late, early as 8 o'clock at night after taking evening prashadam. And then he would take rest for two hours. And then he would wake up and do translating again. So altogether every night he translated four to six hours while everyone was sleeping. And then at the end of his translation, around three o'clock, two, two or three o'clock in the morning or later, he would again take rest for two hours. So it depended on where he was as to whether he went to the morning program or not. But if he didn't go to the morning program, it meant that he was translating extra time. And that's where Prabhupada's books came from. He would write, uh, he would dictate into the tape, then the tape would be uh, sent to Los Angeles, where it would be transcribed, and then people would edit, it would be transcribed and turned into page form, book form, and then after that, they would be edited by Hari Griva. So it was an amazing schedule that he had. And he never seemed to face. Oh, yes. He got his another two hours of rest in the afternoon, between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He would lie down. And I remember seeing him in New Vrindavan, just lying by the side of the road on a shawl, asleep for two hours. I would be dumbfounded to see him there. And that's how he got his six hours of rest, however many it was, and his six spending the whole night translating as well, except for little sleep breaks. Okay, is that okay? Did I answer the question? I think you did. Yes, he's he's uh, here still. Manoj Prabhu is here. Um, Who is there? Manoj asked that question, and he said, "Okay, Prabhuji." He said, "Okay." Thank okay. you. Did you like the answer? Ah, yes, Prabhuji. Really good. Excellent. I'm one of the few people that ever listened to Prabhupada dictating, except for his personal servant. 
Mahaprabhu, um, do you want to see a video at the end of the show, Mahaprabhu? This one ask you, so I can start.